such an exciting week last week with 10 congressional candidates here. I knew you were all looking forward to this week. Uh, this week we have our Humboldt County First District Supervisor candidates, uh, Annette Di Modena, Rex Bone, and Cheryl Seidner. As always, we'll have the League of Women Voters moderating this. I've already started collecting questions. There should be some, uh, uh, we call these things, uh, cards at your desk or table. Please fill them out and I'll be going around the room collecting them. League of Women Voters will then filter through them and ask the questions of the candidates in there. And who in the League is going to, Beth, are you doing this again? Uh, let's get this uh, show started. Beth, the League of Women Voters. My name is Beth Matsumoto. I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Humboldt County. The League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization, encourages the informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. We are happy to moderate today's candidate forum for the Humboldt County First District Supervisor. Please refrain from any demonstrations of support or opposition during the forum. We will thank the candidates with our applause at the end. Today we have with us Rex Bone, Annette DeModena, and Cheryl Seidner. Uh, just a few comments on the format of the forum. Um, please write your questions on the cards provided. We have ushers that will come and pick them up from you. Keep in mind that your question must be appropriate for all of the candidates to answer. Uh, and let's see, each candidate will have one minute uh, to answer each question. We will start with opening statements uh, in a one minute format, and then we'll end the forum, forum with a one minute closing statement. The volunteers with us today are timekeeper Carol Masterson, and question sorters Debbie Hartridge and Beth Post. Uh, Dave Rosso is also here to collect questions from the audience. Uh, if the candidates are ready, we will begin with our opening statements in alphabetical order. Uh, Rex Bone, we will hear for your opening statement first. And candidates, please stand as you are addressing the audience. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the Rotary. I want to thank um, League of Women's Voters. Um, I'm running for first district supervisor because I want to take my level of commitment to the community one step farther. I think there are things that can be done. Um, I've pr I'm a proven fact that I have, I can get things done. Supervisors are not going to create jobs. We all know that. But they can sure facilitate it so people can actually come here. We can go out there and we can talk to the businesses that are here. Why don't we see what we're doing right? Why don't we pre-permit some property? Why don't we have open the door, put a sign up that said, we're open for business in Humboldt County. We're a vibrant community. We've got two great education facilities. We've got great people that want to work. And the, the biggest thing is we've got a great port. We've got great people, and when you're off work, what a better place to be off work than in Humboldt County. So I look forward to being your next first district supervisor. And again, thank you for being here. Annette DeModena, your opening statement, please. Service is the key to, my, to the way I've lived my life. No matter what I've done, I've always wanted to be of service to others. And since I left teaching, I decided to be part of service coming into the community. And what I've done is I've been on grand jury, I've been to many board meetings, I, I'm a member of Keep Fundraising Committee, I'm a member of the Sequoia Zoo Board Foundation. But as I went around, uh, especially while I was working in the, on the grand jury, I've come to know far deeper and wider the issues that concern everyone here in Humboldt County. And because of my concept of service and dedication and devotion to anything that I do, that I push myself all the way that much harder, I've chosen to come into this race for District 1 Supervisor. And I promise you, I will not disappoint, because I do understand the issues. I do understand the need for jobs. I do need understand the need for greater uh, opportunities and transportation to make this a viable, economically growing community. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Cheryl Seidner, your opening statement, please. Hot, what, low, Rick, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cheryl Seidner, and I just wanted to say thank you to the League and thank you to the Rotary. Very nice to see you this afternoon. I was born and raised in the first district. Lived here all my life, except for three short years in San Francisco. 
Went to school in Lolita and Fort Tennis Schools. Went to school at Hill College of Business and was hired there for two years before I came home. And you know it's time to come home when your mom starts sending you job descriptions. So I, that was one of those things. I, my roots go very deep here in the community. I look to the people who live here with their ideas of making it a better place. I want to be your voice for all people. I thank you for this time and effort for putting this together. And I have more to say, but running out of time. Oh, thank you. Now on to the question portion of our forum. Uh, the candidates have drawn lots to determine which candidate will have the first opportunity to answer the first question. Annette DeModna will have the first opportunity to answer this question. Name one accomplishment the Board of Supervisors has made in the past five years that has produced a positive benefit for Humboldt County citizens. Well, I would probably say the fact that they have they adopted some time ago the Prosperity 2012 plan. And since, and from 19, now I think it's, um, that was about 2008, and now it's come back around again. And we have the opportunity to look at economic growth in Humboldt County. And I think it, it and being part of three of those committees, it's been, um, it's been a wonderful thing to be a part of, whether it's, uh, for me, harbor revitalization or feasibility of the railroad study. What they did in approving that plan was paramount to what we're going to be seeing within the next five years to a decade, and that is very, very important. Cheryl Seidner, same question. There are so many things that the county has to do, and I think one of those things, I can't put my finger on it, but hopefully that they are listening to their communities, that they are listening to the people that put them in office, that looking to those things that, as Rex had said, that they can't create the jobs, we can. You in this community can make those make that difference. And working with that with each one is making a difference for the community at large. But I agree also that the prosperity is fabulous because what happens is that we reach down strong into the people that live here who have got those jobs, those industries, those niches that we're working for and seeing what we can do better. Thank you. Rex Bone? I think they've done a couple of good things, not just a couple, but I think they're starting to work together a little bit better. Um, but I think the redundant um, fiber optic line is a big thing for a lot of people in business. I think probably their management of the Headwaters Fund, it's not always um, exactly where we want it to be, but it's got about $18 million in it. started with 18 and they've loaned out about $12 million. But I think the one I'm most excited about is um, they've just granted quite a bit of money to pre-permit some lands out here in our harbor for the oyster miracle, for the oyster industry. And I think that's a growth industry. 80% of the oysters that are raised right here in Humboldt County, that's 80% are consumed right here in California. It's a little niche industry, but we can grow off of that. And there's other industries that will follow off of that and still utilize our bay, the North Bay, and places that will work. So I applaud the board on doing those two things and keeping an eye on the headwaters. Okay, you'll have the next question as well. The first opportunity to answer this question. Could you please share your thoughts and plans with economic development versus environmental preservation? Well, I think they can go hand in hand, and we've proven that uh, over and over, both with um, the restrictions on the timber industry, and they seem to we have two very large timber companies that are doing a great job. Again, the Headwaters money just gave some money to, um, it went partnership with the two biggest redwood companies to promote the our majestic redwoods, about 65% of the redwood um, forest lay right here in Humboldt County. So I think what you need to do is we have an economic development director. I think we need to go out and pound on some doors. And it's like I said earlier, we need to pre-permit some properties, let people know we have an area for them to come up here. We have able workforce. It, it gets so simple once we start providing jobs around this area. And part of it is we need to hold the government. We need to put a bigger bridle on the government and not restrict businesses so much. We need to find out what can we do for you instead what can we do to hold you back. And I think that's the biggest problem we have right now is we need, government wants to work with us. I think we need to work with them to tell us how they can do it. And then we can probably have a little bit more um, jobs um, and stop. <laughs> Annette DeModna, same question. 
Well, like, actually, I hate to agree with my opponent over here, but it's true. There is a balance that can be made between what we do as far as economic development and land use, and there should be. There should be exactly that. And what I would like to see is a foundational base, in grow, a growing more economic base, a growing foundation where, once again, and I'm going back to this because this is part of my mantra, and that is, let's develop the harbor. Let's develop, let's look at the feasibility of the railroad study, all in all, because we have to establish that foundation on which jobs can be created. And as we do that, we look at the land use, if we come to some other decisions, we look at our rivers, and we see how can they be protected as we build the rail system. What is, thank you. Um, so, that's where I'm coming from, is the balance between what we already have and the building of that, and also looking at our land use. I am for growth, I am for development, but I also am for responsible stewardship of the land. Thank you. Cheryl Seidner. You're doing good. <laughs> I think we need to streamline our regulations, that they're in one place, that they're not scattered all over Humboldt County. I believe that we need to make sure that we talk to one another in the different departments in Humboldt County because of some of the things I do understand is that one office does not talk to the other office. That makes all of us as citizens really hard to try to go in and work with a group of individuals and we can't get there. Education is very important. Education is, we've got to find Univers or have a university and community college, we need to make sure that they are educating the young people and people who want to go back to work in a different field. And I think we need to assist and collaborate with one another to get these things going. And we need to bring balance. Our, environmental, our environment cannot be out of whack. We have to bring balance to the system. Cheryl, you'll have the first opportunity to answer this question. <laughs> Could you please share your thoughts regarding the planning and building permit process, including the size of the related department's staffing and budget issues? Okay. Are we, uh, I'm trying to hold this correctly. I think what I said earlier is to make sure that we have communications between, read that again. Sure. Please. Could you could you please share your thoughts regarding the planning and building permit process, including the size of the related department's staffing and budgeting issues? Communication is a, a foremost thing that we need to do. We don't talk to one another in the different departments. And how does one know what the other one is doing? Case in point, a gentleman who was opening up a business did all what he needed to do, got the permitting, got it down, got it ready and was ready to open the business, and then the planning office or one of the offices came in and said, sorry, you can't build here, you can't open up your business because this is a different area, you gotta go and seek a different permit. And that's, we wanna bring business here, we wanna bring the people who live here and opening it up to businesses and we're not talking to one another. We have to do that. We need to come together to understand what's going on. And planning department needs to, I think it's on its way to getting better at what it's doing. Rex Bone, same question. I think the Board of Supes tomorrow are going to address some of these issues. But I think what you need to do is put a system of checks and balances. I've been fortunate working in the private sector. I've done jobs over in Shasta, Tehama, and Butte County, and Sacramento. And they actually look forward to you doing business. They actually look forward to you creating the jobs. 121 permits were issued last year in the county. Um, the budget is extreme, $20 million plus. Um, a lot of that's being thrown chasing the general plan, which is still not done. So I think what we need to do is make it business friendly, put a system of checks and balances. If it was a private business, you could rent that office because they'd be out of business because they don't do the job right. And I think what it is, it comes from the top, and I think that mindset may be changing if we bring somebody in that's community-minded and realizes something to do with customer service and actually looks forward. So what we need to do is talk to the people that do business there and see what needs to be changed. They might have the answers. Annette Thank you. 
One of the things that I have seen also through my work on the grand jury is the need, um, and it's already printed, so it's nothing I'm saying out of turn. One of the things that I have seen is the absolute necessity to get everyone on the same page in the planning department, and the concept is service. Service to those who come in, and quick service. But we need to develop something over there that we have everybody on the same page, some sort of training system that's going on, some sort of review system that's going on to make them user-friendly for all of those of you and me who need to use their services. I also like the idea, too, that there has been a slight, they're, they're working on, the Board of Supervisors is right now working on a division of duties, whereas the natural resources uh, is going to be coming into the, um, under environmental services, under Public Works and Tom Matson. I like the idea that the Planning co uh, Commission itself, Planning Department itself, is going to be smaller and headed by uh, Martha Spencer. Thank you. The next question will go to Rex Boone first. And the question is, can you tell us about your largest financial supporters and are any of them from outside of Humboldt County? You know, I, I checked this week and I've had over 910 people donate to my campaign. I think my best one is a, a lady gave me a dollar. She was on fixed income, but she wanted to be part of the campaign. It probably meant the most to me. Um, my largest contributors would probably be, I got the endorsement from the Humboldt Deputy Sheriff's Organization and they gave me $5,000 and I, since one of my platforms is public safety, that means a lot. And then I've got a small hardware store, family owned hardware store in Henderson Center. Um, Jack Rickey, who has uh, been a very good supporter. So um, I think I'm more proud that I've got 900 people that have donated my campaign to, than my larger ones. Um, we've been very fortunate. I, uh, I appreciate it. I have envelopes if anybody wants to donate. Um, <laughs> but I think the idea to run a good campaign and to get the word out there and, and get your vision out there, it's um, fortunate that I've had people be part of my campaign. So thank you. Cheryl, I have a, a, a treasurer who deals with all the money that's coming in. I don't usually see any of it. Now and again, she'll call me and tell me that we've gotten a, um, a large donation. And most of my donations are between $5 and $1,000. Those are just very few. And I am really sad that I... Oh, I know, $1,500 from the uh, AFSCME credit, I mean the union, and that's the Humboldt County employees. And I, I, I'm a grassroots. We have a grassroots campaign, and we spend our money as wisely as we possibly can, and to get the word out that we are running, and that we are here, that we want to have put people first, because that's what it's all about. It's about you, and not so much about me. Annette Morna. I like that, Cheryl. It's about you. It's not about me. We, I'm here to serve. And uh, it, my too, mine too, my election too, is a grassroots thing. Absolutely grassroots. My highest contributor was $1,000. And uh, once again, I have a website. You can donate on it if you choose. So that's, that's the, the extent of it. Okay. The question will go to you first. Let's see. What specific programs would you advocate to bring jobs here? Okay. Specific, well, it's not so much specific jobs as it is specific conditions. We want to see harbor revitalization. We want to see the harbor developed so that we can be used to, um, okay, let me start with the railroad. Feasibility railroad study. We do a feasible railroad study. If we get to do this wonderful, get, have this wonderful opportunity to build this east and west railroad all the way down to Red Buff or Gerber, wherever it's going to end up, it's going to cross us over into the Midwest where we can take their grain, bring it over into a new harbor that's been completely uh, is green and can take these shipments over to Asia. Do you know that it's cheaper for a ship to take the grain from Eureka, California and take it over to Asia by one or two days? Look at the money that people are going to save. Look at the way we can bring in prosperity here into our county. Thank you. Okay. Rex Bowen, same question. I think there's a lot of employers in the room, and I think that the main thing you have to focus on is back to our two um, institutions, and even our high schools with our HROP programs. 
It's a proven factor that if you have a trained workforce, the employers will follow it. If you let the employers know, hey, I've got 100 guys here that can make that little widget, and they can make the best damn widget there is, you're going to find those people coming here because they, they want people that are going to make their widgets without training them because these guys are already trained, safety, and then if you throw in the pre-plant, if you throw in the pre-permitted property so they don't have to go through those channels, what we need to do is California is a tough place to do business. California is a tough place to do business. So let's let's not depend on California. Let's let them know Humboldt County is an easy place and a good place to do business. And then you fall back on what a, we, we have so many attributes here that when the kid when they're off the schools everything else, it'd be a great thing. So they'll come up here to work because this is a great place to be. Cheryl Seidner. Our bay is underutilized. We need to use our bay wisely and responsibly. We need to um, make sure our education systems are ready for our youth so that our youth can stay here and look at what we have. But as I, I went away for th two years, three years, and came back with some skills that I may not have gotten here. But it's great to come back to home, so it's always also good to go away to school and bring those skills back to us. We need to develop the industries that are already here, working with them to make them stronger and realizing that some of the regulations we need to streamline, as we said earlier. We can't depend upon retail. We have to look beyond that. And we have a lot of people here, like we said earlier, that have the skills, that have the knowledge. Let's help them get those businesses out there. We gotta rely upon ourselves for the solutions. Thank you. The next question will go to you first again, Cheryl. Okay. The question is, please address your experience in the private sector and the public sector, as well as working for any governmental agencies. I, I was elected office to the tribal chair of the um, Weop tribe. I am I'm, I'm befuddled. Give me, the, give me the question again. Sure. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Your work experience in the private sector and the public sector, okay. and if you've worked for any governmental agencies. When I moved home, I came to work for uh, Humboldt County Schools Office, and then I worked for Indian Action Council, preschool, and tutorial, and library, and the community at large. Then we worked, I worked at Humboldt State University for 28 years. When I left after 28 years with, with the Educational Opportunity Program, where the students were low income, first generation college, I worked with those students personally to help them fill out their applications, their financial aid applications, and dealing with sometimes homesickness. I would have students come in and just sit down in my office and not say anything. Just wanted to be resting in my office. Thank you. Annette de Modena. I was a teacher for 28 years. I don't know whether you want to put that into the public sector or the government sector, but there it is. I taught high school down in El Monte, California, where I taught history, and then I taught 24 years at Zane Middle School. Enjoyed it all. I had a small business when I first came to Eureka. I had a small business, probably one of the first of its kind up here. It was a demonstration business, the kind that you see in Costco. I used to hire ladies um, and, and train them, and we had uh, we, we uh, service stores from Garberville all the way to Crescent City. Then I taught, I rather I worked at Arthur Johnson's for a short while before I ended up going back into the teaching profession. And anything else that I missed? Rex Bowen, same question. Um, I've probably got the best of both worlds. I've been in the private sector when I started at nine years old sorting bottles at my dad's grocery store at Park Grocery next to Sequoia Park. And I'd work for three hours and I got a box of baseball cards. My mom threw those away about 15 years ago, so there was my wealth, so boxes and boxes I opened. But no, I've been in the private sector my whole life. I've created jobs, and then I also got to spend 12 years on the 9th District Ag, which is better known as the Redwood Acres Fairport 7 as president. So I got to work with the state bureaucracy, got to meet a budget there. I owned a small business in Eureka, oh, back in the late 70s, had nine employees. It was a bar and a restaurant in downtown Eureka. And uh, so I got a 
pretty good taste of the, the uh, being an independent employer. And then I worked for small family-owned businesses most of the, my career, except for two years. Uh, worked across the bay at the pulp mill. So I've got a pretty good mix of private and public sector employment. So I think I can hit them both sides. Thank you. Annette DeModena, this question will go to you first. If elected, what is your approach to the Occupy Humboldt group? Okay, a can of worms. <laughs> I believe in free speech. I always have and I always will. But there also comes with free speech a responsibility to in, in, uh, in your presentation, in your protest. And so it was, I had no problem with, with, Humboldt, with it being there. However, once it began to take away the rights of others from their free speech, then it became a problem. And so we have to then look at the city, the city regulations and say, what do we do? And then something was done. And I support what was done. And I know that the Board of Supervisors will continue to look at it and study it and do what is right for the people of Humboldt County. Sheriff Seidner, same question to you about Occupy Humboldt. Free speech is very important. And to stop free speech is not a good thing. I, I do not believe that was one of the best ways to go about it. I think that we're... Um, one of the things I look at as, as your mantra here for today is to reach within and to embrace humanity. And when we have humanity who feels that they've been disenfranchised and not able to say that they cannot voice their opinions, because if you look at the very beginning of Occupy, it wasn't always with those who were disenfranchised. It was with people who, who were teachers, people who were professors, and you look at all of that, and then other folks start streaming in. We need to sit down and look and collaborate. There were things already set, ready to go, but again, departments not talking to one another. Rex Bone? I think it was a, I don't think our forefathers planned on people camping out in front of our county seat 200 years ago. I don't think they planned on them defecating on the lawns. I don't think they planned on making them what has that has turned down to. I was down there at 4.30 this morning, so I decided to get off my bicycle and I walked the sidewalk. And if you've noticed now a little bit of thing, I think the police, the sheriff, I think they've done a great job, the supervisors on the ordinance, but what they've done now is they can't sleep on county lands at night. So what they've done is they've gone to the sidewalk, which is Caltrans property. And there were six of them sleeping there, two of them sitting on the bench with the obligatory marijuana going on, and it may have been medical, which I support. But the thing is, the people are being harassed when they go into the courthouse. A lot of the employees go in the back way. Their rights have been affected because they cannot go to work freely. And I think it needs to be cleaned up. It is not a First Amendment right. It's turned into a homeless encampment. And we need to find out some of them. We need to fix it. OK, Rex, you can keep the microphone. This question will go to you first. Uh, it's a two I felt like I'm a church. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Uh, what is the biggest strength of your opponents, and who would you vote for if you weren't running? Oh, I think, you know, in all honesty, I think I'm very fortunate. I've got two very nice ladies um, that I'm running against, so I think that takes a lot of pressure off me, um, so I don't think it needs to get nasty. I don't think the campaign has taken a very good, um, they both have mentioned grassroots, and mine's is Rudy as it gets. I don't have any paid advisors or anything else. I have a lot of volunteers. Um, if I had to vote for either one of them, I might take the Stacy Lawson approach and not vote at all. But um, <laughs> so I don't make anybody upset. But in all honesty, I really don't know if I could pick one or the other because they both bring a lot to the table, um, but they don't bring enough for me to vote for either one of them. Annette Modena, same question. Thank you very much. Um, would you repeat the question? <laughs> what is the biggest strength of your opponents, and who would you vote for if you weren't running? Well, the biggest strength of Rex, of course, is name recognition. And my dear friend Cheryl, we do know each other. We have another life. 
Um, and Cheryl is just dear and deep and um, just as an abiding a soul as you'd ever want to have meet. And uh, so from, it would be very difficult for, I mean, yeah, you want me to tell you? I vote for Cheryl because we're friends. I know her. I know what she'll do. And, but, however, I think the same way Rex is. I have a, a background and experience in teaching, which, has, which in its organization, preparation, and management sets me to the place where I know I can do this job, and I really am not going to vote for anyone but me. Cheryl Seidner, same question. Good answer, good answer. <laughs> Me and this microphone don't do it. Don't do it. Well, I have been sitting with these two individuals for the last four or five weeks now. And it's been good. It's every time we get together, we do chat. We do give each other a hug now and again. And we congratulate each other on it. See? And we all have, bring with us very good strength. And each one, you know, talks about their strengths themselves. And that, that's good because they think highly of themselves. And that's not a bad thing. And, you know, Rex, you need to vote regardless of if you weren't running at all. You need to vote one way or the other because that is our right to do so. I signed up at 21 years old because that's when I could vote. Yeah, I'm a little older than some of I see a couple of youth out there. Cheryl, this question will go to you first. It has to do with small businesses. And what can be done to help small businesses in Humboldt County? Listening to them, buy local. Don't go outside and, I mean, I do one of the things that when it comes spring and summer and fall, all my vegetables, 99% of my vegetables are from farmer's market. Because I know what they do, I know where they're bringing the food in, I don't have to guess of what country it's coming from, what county it's coming from, it's coming from home. I, I believe that we need to streamline the regulations that are out there. I'm not saying to, deal, to deal, go away with those regulations, but we need a little bit smaller government. It's people first, and if we don't put people first, then things get out of hand. And so I believe that we need to work with those industries that are here, make them viable, and work bigger and get grow larger, and then we can be able to um, put our people to work. Rex Bone, same question. Well, I was raised in a small business, um, owned one for a while, as I mentioned. I think what we need to do is so many government regulations are cast at if you have 15 employees, 20, 25 employees. And I think what they need to do is base that on gross revenues a little bit more than on numbers because I've seen a lot of businesses hit that plateau of 24 employees. They can hire some more employees, but they don't want to go to that level of providing this and that. I think businesses and their demands of their employees are going to meet the, the requirements. If you provide good benefits, if you provide a good working return, you know, um, environment, you're going to get the employees. And if you have good employees, you're going to make some money and you're going to be able to share that wealth. And I think the best employees are the ones who want to share in your, in your success and make things work for you. So I think that's what we have to do. And again, I've said it over and over, go talk to these small businesses. Why don't we find out what we're doing right and work on that. And then when the new businesses come to town, we'll be ready for them and say, you know what, we do really good, we do this. And that'll help us in the future. Annette Demodna? Would you repeat the question? Sure. Please? It has to do with small businesses and what can be done to help small businesses in Humboldt County? One of the things, of course, is giving them a labor force that is adequate to meet their needs. And that would include vocational training. And that's, one, again, one of the other committees that I'm on in regard to prosperity uh, 2012 is a vocational training aspect and working with CR and we have been discussing the uh, uh, the type of um, 
the type of uh, training that we need to give the employees what they want. And especially now, with the, the new jobs coming in, are requiring more technical education, and they need either a certificate or a diploma of some kind in regard to um, uh, what, their, what the, their ability to be employed. So anyway, giving them a good workforce is important. And once again, too, looking at these regulations, and uh, because they are crippling. They are crippling. I had a, a friend who uh, has, a, has a business in town, and the, the amount of money he had to put out in insurances as well as worker protection was phenomenal, and we need to do something about that. Thank you, and the question will go to you first again. Mm -hmm. it, this has to do with specifically to District 1, and it is, what issues or challenges do you identify as being very specific to the first district, and what would your solutions be? Well, I think it's a little early to say what the solutions are going to be, but one thing that we have in District 1 is such a variety of lifestyles. We have ranchers, we have uh, dairymen, we have farmers, and then we have the people who work in the cities, and we have their, our big lumber companies, and we have our wonderful oyster beds out there. We have so many, th so many, so many people with so many diverse needs that it would be difficult to um, actually come up with a solution for any one trail program. But what we do need, of course, are roads. We need those. We need roads. We need. Um, I'm losing my thoughts. But anyway, we need road improvement. We need to make sure that the Redwood Highway continues to move through the way it needs to for, for our, um, our goods to get through. And uh, we need to come together as a community because it doesn't really matter what kind of needs one group has over another. We need to learn to work together. Cheryl Seidner. We have a big community. It is large, from mountain and hills to the pavements of the streets of Eureka. Very large. We have three rivers that we need to make sure that we continue to keep clean. And with those, we have other things that are happening that are illegal. What are we going to do with that? And I think those are one of the things that is, and you know what I have to say without having to say it out loud, but it's the marijuana growth. They are banking our streams. They are making it bad. What are we going to do with that? I don't have the solution. That's where you all come in, that we work together in those solutions. But one of those solutions is, is that we need to put regulations on that part of growing that. When people need it for a reason, they've got their little card, the 215 card, that this is big. And you all know what's going on. And I need you to help us get through it. Rex I think the issues facing the first district coming up, you know, right now, um, Eel River, obviously, with the Potter Valley diversion, um, we're a third world country up here when it comes to water. They divert that water, and it's going to the wineries, it's going everywhere but here. Um, historically, the flows are the same they were before the Potter Valley right now, but the other thing is we have to create cooling ponds for the fish and things like that. The, the thousand pound gorilla in the first district? There's probably affected people from Atoll to Ferndale, Lolita, the wind farm. Shell Energy's wind proposal, which they have actually, I've been to two, both the meetings at uh, Ferndale, and I have never seen a worse proposal put together in my life that Shell brought forward. And I think what it's done is, over the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to some of the ranchers that have actually signed. They've disenfranchised some of the ranchers because it has not done so well. So having those 20 year old units up on top when the technology is changing so quick. I don't know if that's the best use of our uh, Bear River Ridge, and I think that's something they're going to have to look into very heavily. Okay, this question will go to you first again. It has to do with the airline industry. Would you support wide community financial support to get another airline into Humboldt County, and what role should business play? You know, that's a, that's a tough one for the first district, because if you live on the south side of Eureka, you can be in Sacramento in four and a half hours. We don't have to subsidize anything. It's never fogged in. You get in and out, and it's a great little airport. Um, no, I don't think we should subsidize a bankrupt airport. I think we're going to need that. We're going to need the infrastructure. But I think if we sit out there, and Greg's left, so I can say whatever I want, I think. So, um, oh, no, he's still here. Sorry, Greg. No. I think, I think he's done. I, 
I think he's I think he's done a yeoman's job of trying to get here, and the Redwood Region Economic Development has done a great job getting someone in here. But we were one of the companies that bought a twenty-five thousand dollar credit card for Delta and never got to use it up. So I've just I've just got a faction where these people need to. Uh, I don't know if we should subsidize them. I know it's good for the I know it's good for the business. Or we need to put a cap on it so we don't, you know, I don't think it should be, we need to find out how many jobs it's actually going to create before we use Headwaters money. Annette de Modena? Thank you. Repeat the question, please. Sure. What would you, would you support wide community financial support for another airline into Humboldt County and what role should business play? Well, I'm not sure that that would, it would be a direction we could go and we certainly have to look at that. I'm not. I I have my uh, my concerns about it being part of the business community because I don't think I don't I don't think it's their responsibility to be I have to do that. However, I I'm very concerned with when it comes to this the second airline coming in that our money is being used whether it's through Redeck or any place else. It's uh, the taxpayers' money that's being used, and I'd like to see a lot more statistical work being done. I want to see more of what actually. Uh, they can bring to the table instead of what we bring to the table. I know that this is the way people do things, the, the companies do things nowadays, tell me what you're going to give me. Well, that's all fine. We're giving you a place to do business. So from that aspect, let's take another look at the negotiations. Let's take a look at what they say are the statistics to make us feel better about what they are going to be giving us through their service in terms, because they're the ones who are actually reaping a far bigger benefit than we are. Cheryl Seidner. I, I think about the wind, wind, shell wind in Ferndale that we're giving money away, our taxpayers' money, to a foreign company. Though this is not a foreign company that's coming in and wanting to be, but they want us to subsidize. Is that a wise use of our taxpayers' dollars? Now I realize we can't get out of here sometimes. During World War II, this is where they brought the planes in so the pilots can get, learn how to go out and uh, fight the war when they were in England. And so it's hard to get in and out of here at times. I know one day I spent two days trying to get out of here. But, you know, and it, for the businesses that have to come and go, it's difficult. So I, I have to see more statistics, I have to see more reports before I can make a real definitive answer to that. It's going to take us, again, it's going to take us all. Annette de Modena, this is going to be our last question before we move into closing statements, but this question will go to you first. It's about Richardson Grove, and what is your feeling on the Richardson Grove road project? We need to see it through. Simple. Plain and simple. We need it. We need it for business. We need to see it through. I want to see it done. Uh, I'm sorry, Cheryl Seidner, same question about Richardson Grove. I'm getting a workout up and down, up and down. It needs, I think the realignment phase of it, I think is a good idea. We need to bring things in. We need to get things out because we have some businesses up here that are not just Humboldt County alone. They are going throughout the state of California, and some of them have gone global. We should be really proud of that. And so in that, we need to look at Richardson with a real good finite and see how we can get through it. I, my dad was a faller. He fell those big, huge redwood trees. And I would not like to see those go. And so we have to look at it. I think we need to get through it, and we need to get through it as soon as we possibly can, and, and the best way we can. Thank you, Rex Bowen. I think for the safety of the kids that ride the school buses down there, um, in a former life I drove truck down there for years and probably been through the Grove 800 times in a truck. Um, the realignment is going to affect, I think, seven or eight trees. It's not going to affect any old growth trees. I think it's something that needs to be done. Um, the factor has to be, it's going to be a longer trailer. It's not going to, it's going to be the same trucks that are going through there. It's not going to be a big behemoth truck. It's going to be the same Peterbilt, Kenworth, Brakeliners are going through there now. It's just a little bit longer. And what that does, it allows some of our local businesses who can't make weight in these other things, makes them more competitive. 
and we do have people shipping to the East Coast. Again, there are people that are having to reload product in Oakland on a regular, on a daily basis into other trucks and bring it up here at a cost of about $890 a load. Or you can get your trailer hauled through the Grove for $225. Good economics for somebody, but bad for business overall. We need to make that open so it looks like we're open for business up here. Thank you. It's time for closing statements, and we're going to hear from Cheryl Seidner first. We've had some really excellent questions from you, audience. Thank you. Some of the questions that weren't asked that the candidates may want to address in their closing statements include cutting red tape, improving recreation, how long ago did you decide to run, and citizens advisory committees from McKinleyville and the general plan update. So Cheryl Seidner, your closing statement, please. Well, thank you for your time today. I know you are distance people that you have to go out and work and I thank you for that time. I'm running for first district supervisor, and I'm asking you to think about what you've heard today and choose wisely. As the old movie saying went, choose wisely. I'm honored to be endorsed by Wesley Tesbrough and former Assemblywoman Patty Bird. And the uh, Central Labor Union, it, it's been a great time to sit and talk with people in the community as well as the union people. And one of the things I wanted to let you know is that I leave you with this. is My door will always be open. It will not be closed. I will not talk to private in, um, individuals regarding development. I, will, I want to talk to all. My door will always be open. I want to build a quality of life here with you as your, your candidate. Annette DeModna, your closing statement, please. Thank you. One of the things that I have seen throughout uh, my meetings, the meetings that I have been to at Board of Supervisors every, every Tuesday, com commission meetings and so forth, one thing that I have seen is the concept of we and they, and it has to stop. We need to come together. My theme is collaboration and consensus create come unity and that's what is beginning to happen in Humboldt County whether it's in Lolita with the, with their community uh, development plan or through Prosperity 21 I'm excited and I am energized to see the way in which we are beginning to work together for the common goal instead of my agenda versus your agenda and these things are so critical to our to our growth as a community as a county and I want to say that I offer a new voice and a new vision to you, the voters. We'll make a difference in District 1 and in Humboldt County. So I ask for your go, because together it works for all of us. So I ask for your vote on June 5th. Thank you. Rex Bone, your closing statement, please. I decided I was going to run about four years ago, and I kind of just started watching everything that's going on, and decided we could make some changes, and, and a lot of the stuff we talked about. Um, the big advantage of I, I have is throughout my community work and, and private enterprise work, I know people from one end of the county to the other. So I can make these people come together. I can reach across the aisle. We can make things happen. We're not that far off from creating jobs. I've, I've, I've saved jobs. I've created jobs. Public safety. I've got the endorsement from the sheriff's office. Our harbor. I met with the longshoremen. I got the endorsement from the longshoremen union because I've got ideas that we can do. We can move finished products out of here, not necessarily logs, but as they're going out now, that helps the property owners right now meet their tax bills. So we can make things happen. We can do stuff. I love this community. Um, somebody asked me one time, I suppose you're running for the kids. And I says, you're right, I am. I want all the kids to get the opportunity to stay here if they want. And I think we can do that. Thank you, candidates, for taking time out of your busy schedules for being here today. And thank you, Rotary, for sponsoring this. If you're interested in more nonpartisan election information, easyvoterguide.org, smartvoter.org, as well as lwvhc.org are great resources. Thank you very much. As always, I thank the League of Women Voters for a great job. Uh, we have a tradition here. We uh, let our program sign a book, uh, which we then give to the library. This is on the <coughs> mysteries of Angkor Wat, uh, exploring Cambodia's ancient temple and how they took care of it. It's actually anger management. <laughs> 
Anyway, it's cute sign is for you on the inside cover. week, Will K will be uh, standing where I am. I want to thank you all for coming and th thank the League of Women Voters and that's it. So were you told you couldn't let your children play? Yeah, gave me a ticket to boot. I don't know what. I've...